Who would be a teacher? Honestly, I ask you. Is there a more underappreciated profession on our planet? As rewarding as it can be, teaching is, more often than not, a thankless task, and one which society all too often turns its back on. Such is the case in tonight's story, another fantastic one from Dr. Creepen's Vault, sent directly to me so I could read it all for you. Are you ready? I think you are. So it's time once again to sit back and relax with your favourite drink, and listen. I was a substitute teacher in a small town called Bentonsport in Iowa. Bentonsport is one of those towns where there's only a couple of traffic lights, a few general stores, and where everyone knows everyone. People reacted strangely to me because, well, I was an outsider. This didn't bother me, though. I only moved to this town because my grandmother was old and sick, and she asked me to come live with her, being that, well, I was her only living relative. We never really had that much interaction, so for me it was a random, pleasant surprise that she would even consider me to stay and help her. My mother died when I was a baby, leaving me to be raised by my father for the majority of my life. When I was 19 in college, my father went on a business trip, and that was the last anyone had ever heard of him. It's still a missing persons case to this day. No aunts or uncles, no cousins, it was only me. I didn't mind that either, because well, her house was huge and she had a few fancy cars and guns that would keep me occupied whenever I got bored. And on top of that, the few times in my life when I met her, she was the sweetest old lady. The outside world would refer to this town as a hick town in Iowa, but for me, it was my escape. Recently, I'd broken up with my girlfriend and the freedom that this small town was offering me was my perfect opportunity to start over. I decided that all of my years of college should finally go to use, and I should get a, <laughs> a real job. As a matter of fact, that was the main reason my ex was now my ex. Almost immediately after filling out a few applications to work at some of the local businesses in town, I got a substitute teaching opportunity at the town's middle school. I was filled with excitement, but also overtaken by a weird feeling of apprehension. It was that feeling you get when your conscience is screaming at you not to make a bad decision. I wish I would have listened. Instead, I thought about maybe beginning a career as a teacher, and that by accepting this substitute job, I'd be taking my first steps into being a real adult. There was no interview process, just a phone call. The scratchy old voice on the other end of the phone simply said, Thanks for applying, Daniel. We'd like you to start as soon as possible. Please call me at 555-6565 if you have any questions. Oh, thank you. As soon as the phone hung up, I received a text message with details about my start date and the location of the school. There was no description of what I'd be doing or which subject I'd be teaching. Just a start date and the location of the school. Thinking that this position was, well, lacking in details, I decided to call back the number that had just called me. It went straight to voicemail three times, and on the third time I left a voicemail exclaiming that I was a little bit confused about the job details that were provided, and would love more information about the position, but nonetheless, I would be there tomorrow. I hung up the phone, feeling anxious about starting my new job. Even more so, I was excited to start earning money for my future. The mix of excitement and anxiety kept me up all night thinking about what I would encounter as a teacher, especially since I gave my teachers hell coming up through middle school. As I lay in bed, mind racing, I could see the sunlight starting to peak above the horizon in the distance, which meant that I would have to start my first day of my new job with absolutely no sleep. Fuck. I rushed out of the bed and got dressed and kissed my grandmother goodbye, letting her know I should be back before sundown this evening, and then scrambled out of the house. I typed the address from the text message into my GPS, wondering why I hadn't received a call or text message back from my voice message that I'd left the previous day. Uh, maybe they got busy, 
is what I told myself, so as to not think too hard on it. The GPS said that the destination was ten minutes from where my grandmother's house was. This was odd, because if you drive ten minutes in any direction in this town, you'll be out of the town and in some unclaimed backcountry. Regardless, I made the trip, and pulled up to a creaky old wooden cabin that had not aged well with time. It had holes in the roof, and some of the dusty glass windows were broken. The building was also shrouded by trees, and had an old, beat-up sign in the front that read, Alfred Weatherby Middle School, established 1901. There were a few cars parked in a dirt parking lot, but it seemed there were no kids at the school yet. I couldn't even see any movement from the limited view through the schoolhouse window. I parked my car and approached the front door. As I approached, I heard adults chanting, but couldn't make out exactly what they were saying. They could have been saying the Pledge of Allegiance, or a prayer for all I know, but I honestly couldn't tell. So I brushed it off and opened the front door. To my surprise, there was a group of adults, the women in long white dresses, and the men in button-up shirts with suspenders, standing around in a circle. The room was big, with no furniture other than a beautiful rug on the ground and a single chair. There was a picture on the wall of the ABCs, but other than that, the walls were bare as well. Their focus shifted entirely to me when I burst through the door, and they immediately stopped chanting. That same scratchy voice from the phone spoke out amongst them. It was an older, pale woman, and she said, Ah, you must be Daniel. I'm sorry I didn't return your call last night. We had a staff meeting and I got busy. My name is Dorothy Weatherby, and I'm the headmaster here. Thank you for filling this position. We had an unfortunate absence of one of our most beloved teachers, Mr. Munoz. This is our staff. Our students should be arriving soon. Mrs. Weatherby gestured to the staff, and they dryly waved at me like the emotions had been sucked out of their souls. Then she made a gesture to follow her. Daniel, you'll be teaching the math class, replacing Mr. Munoz due to his, well, unfortunate absence. She walked me down an old dusty hallway that had wooden doors on each side and a really creaky wooden floor, all the way back to a small room with seven desks set up in a semicircle. There were books piled up in the corners, looking like they hadn't been used in decades due to the thick layer of dust that blanketed them. Mrs. Weatherby said, I'll be in the room two doors down if you need me. She walked out of the room, and when she did, a really loud bell started ringing. Now, this wasn't a bell from an intercom system like in every other school across America. No, a real, old-school, real-deal, Liberty Bell sounding ring. As the bell sounded, I looked out the dusty window to see a line of children all wearing animal masks, slowly walking into the building. Weird, I thought. But what hasn't been weird about this day so far? I estimated about twenty children in total, and they all quietly and eerily walked into the main room and sat in a circle on the beautiful rug surrounded by the bare wood floor. Mrs. Weatherby walked into the middle of their circle and said, Welcome, children. You all look so amazing with your animal masks to celebrate the spring equinox. I want you to meet the new substitute replacing Mr. Munoz. Daniel. Everyone say hello, Mr. Daniel. In unison, the kids let out a dry, emotionless, really creepy. Hi, Mr. Daniel. I waved at the eerie-looking kids, still wearing their animal masks. There was a goat, a bird, a bear, a dog, a cat, a bull, and so many other kinds of mask. These masks were not just plastic children's masks like I would have expected them to be, but upon further inspection, they were made of porcelain and looked pretty expensive due to the vintage nature of them. My assignment for the day was to teach basic math, like addition and subtraction, to students who were struggling with math. Instead of switching periods like a normal middle school, this school would focus on one subject per day. 
There were six kids in my class. A bear, a ram, a horse, a deer, a bird, and one child who I must have overlooked initially, because this child wasn't wearing a mask. He had sloppy brown hair. It looked like he came from a struggling household, being that his clothes had holes in them, and his shoes were more worn than any of the other children in the classroom. I was given a classroom roster to take roll. Sally? Here. Jason? Here. Derek? Here. Anders? Here. Emily? Here. Silas? Silas? He doesn't talk at all, but that's Silas. The children pointed at the kid without a mask. Instead of being responsive, he was drawing something on a sheet of paper. Curious, I walked over to Silas to see what he was drawing. When I got close to his desk, he stopped and looked straight up at me and threw my soul with the most piercing stare I had ever seen. I couldn't really make out what was on the paper because I didn't want to bother him too long. But what I saw looked like fire. Okay, class. My name is Mr. Daniel. I'll be your temporary math teacher due to Mr. Munoz's absence. According to the notes he left behind, you're all supposed to learn about the order of operations. They took off their masks and pulled out their notes. I was expecting disfigured-looking faces to appear from behind these creepy masks, but all of these kids look pretty normal. I began going over the lesson plans with no problem until lunch. Okay, get your things for lunch. We're going to go to the main room to eat, I instructed the kids. They got their lunch boxes and lined up at the door. Silas was in the back of the line and, oddly, still hadn't said anything the entire day. As the kids were exiting to go to lunch, Silas slipped me a folded sheet of paper. I put it into my pocket. And then Mrs. Weatherby walked into the room. She said, Daniel, you can take your lunch break now. We'll watch over the kids during lunch. Oh, how did Silas do? Thank you. Um, Silas didn't say a thing the whole day, I responded. Yeah, he's like that. Don't take it personal, Daniel. Enjoy your break. As she walked away, I pulled the paper Silas had slipped to me out of my pocket and unfolded it. To my horror, there was a picture of a man tied to a stake, on fire. He was surrounded by little animal-human hybrid creatures all holding hands. Immediately, I had that gut-wrenching feeling that something was wrong but I tried to brush it off just as Silas being more than a little weird. So, I went to my car and started eating the PB&J that I'd packed for lunch the previous night. I pulled out my phone and started watching Secure Team on YouTube. The connection was pretty bad, so I quickly gave up on that idea. I glanced up as I put my phone away, and I saw Silas standing at the tree line behind the school, talking to what appeared to be an adult. This was alarming because all the adults were inside monitoring the children for lunch. I could barely make out the silhouette of the adult figure because he was shrouded in the trees. However, I could tell it was a male and he looked massive, like inhumanly massive. It was unclear due to the distance, but it looked like he had an animal mask on just like the kids. I quickly got out of my car and yelled, Silas! Silas looked back, and as he did, the man from the trees snatched him into the wooded area out of my view, with a speed that was unnatural. I panicked. Immediately, and quite involuntarily, I began running after him, yelling his name. Sprinting beyond the tree line into the forest, I could see the huge stature of the man way off in the distance. There's no way he could have gotten that far in this little bit of time, but regardless... I continued to chase because I was responsible for this child today and I didn't want Silas to get hurt in any kind of way. After about a hundred yards, I lost sight of the man and Silas. I was in a clearing and what I saw terrified me. I saw a pile of burnt wood and a stake sticking out of the middle. 
This instantly made me think of the picture Silas had handed me before he was abducted. Oh, fuck this, I yelled as I turned around and ran back in the direction I'd come from. Before long, I could see the school through the brush of the forest, and instead of running into the school, I headed straight for my car. I jumped inside to the front seat and started up my car, not hesitating at all to throw my car into reverse and start backing out of my dusty parking spot. Upon looking into the rearview mirror, I let out a gasp so intense that I almost choked. It was Mrs. Weatherby. She was just standing there. Where are you going? The kids were waiting on you, she shouted. She looked really angry and disappointed at the same time. I rolled my window down and yelled to her. Uh, I have an emergency with my grandma, and I have to leave right now. I'm so sorry. I hope I don't inconvenience you. She said nothing and stepped aside. Her countenance went from angry to very calm, as she just stood there, staring at me with a gentle but sinister grin. I'm sure with the speed that I left that place, I kicked up all kinds of dirt on her with my tires, but I was not going to look back. In fact, while driving, I vowed to myself never to go to the outskirts of town again. Instead of going straight back home, I went to a local coffee shop to clear my mind. Plus, I didn't want to alert my grandmother by coming home too soon. For an hour, I slowly sipped on my cappuccino and tried to sort things out. The more I tried to piece it together, the more confused I became. Eventually, I gave up and decided to just forget about it and make sure no psychos were anywhere near my grandmother's house. I pulled into the driveway and everything was peaceful just as it was when I'd left that morning. A small grin of satisfaction came across my face because I felt like I was in a false field of safety at this house. Well, I wish I could say the story ended here, but unfortunately, there's more. I got out of the car and went into the front door. Gran, I'm... Just as I said that, I heard a sharp, pitch ringing in my ears and my vision was completely whited out. Simultaneously, I felt a really sharp pain in the back of my head as I uncontrollably fell to the hardwood floor. Unconscious for God knows how long, I awoke to the same chanting I'd heard before when I walked into that creepy school building. As I regained my vision, I noticed I was, in fact, in that creepy school building Surrounded by teachers, all chanting unrecognizable words in unison. I was unable to move or speak, as they had me bound by thick rope with duct tape covering my mouth. Ice ran through my veins, and my heart was beating irregularly out of fear. Mrs. Weatherby spoke up. You see, Daniel, many years ago my father built this school, and me and my sister have had to look after it when he passed. However, he wasn't ready to pass, as he had more plans for this glorious institution. We prayed to God to have his soul back to finish what he'd started, but we received no answer. So we prayed to the devil, and instantly we were told that he would be allowed amongst the living, so long as we provide two sacrifices a year. Mr. Munoz was the first this year, and thanks to the help of my sister, you will be the second. Although terrified, I was curious as what she meant by her sister. But just as that thought entered my mind, my grandmother entered the room. She walked up to Mrs. Weatherby and said, Father said everything's ready now. Mrs. Weatherby said, Perfect. Then she took a cloth and held it to my nose, and again I found myself unconscious. I awoke, and this time it was night and I was outside. Still unable to move, I found myself tied up to the stake in the woods that I'd seen earlier. They were going to sacrifice me. My heart felt like it was beating a hundred times a second, as I looked around for a way out of this situation. 
I was surrounded by burnt pieces of wood and those god-awful children in their horrifying animal masks. They were singing, he's got the whole world in his hands, really slowly as they joined hands in a circle. It looked as if the masks were melting into the children's faces and they all started looking deformed. The faculty and Mrs. Weatherby held torches in their hands, and now they were also in animal masks. Mrs. Weatherby's masks was a goat. My grandmother began speaking. Tonight we have a bloodline sacrifice, so we shall not need to sacrifice the father for another five years. Sing, my father's children, and celebrate as we send another child into the light. Mercy, father, mercy. Your light shines so bright. With this sacrifice, I hope it is sufficient in bringing you to life. The mutant children began singing louder, when all of a sudden a deep, terrifying, gut-wrenching growl came from the woods. It sounded like a bear, a pit bull, and a lion growling at the same time. Immediately, everything fell dead silent. I started literally trembling with fear and sweating profusely from every pore in my body. The trees in the woods were moving and the only sound that could be heard was a heavy breathing mixed with grunts and wheezing from whatever was in the woods that was getting closer by the second. A horrid stench filled the air, comparable to rotting dead animal flesh mixed with sewage. As the smell overtook the air, I could see the same silhouette of the huge man from earlier, except this time it looked more menacing and way bigger than I'd originally thought. What emerged from the woods was the single most disturbing thing that I'd seen in my life. He, or rather it, had the head of a ram, but the jaw of a bear. The torso was that of a muscular man, and the arms were different. It had one long human arm, with a human hand, but the other arm was just a growth of slimy flesh. The closest thing I can compare it to is a tentacle. It stood on two bull-like legs with hooves at the feet. My brain could not fathom the sight of what I was seeing in front of me. This was a collection of human and animal parts sewn together and brought back to life. What the fuck? It started to approach me, I noticed it was carrying a small cage in its human hand, and inside the cage was Silas. He wasn't crying, just looking sad, as if he was used to this, but still unsatisfied. It put the cage down amongst all the other children. The air was oddly still and cold, filled with the sound of this thing's breathing, and sprinkled with the excited whispers from the children. Father's here. They whispered excitedly, like it was their actual father, and not some cryptid demon creature. My mouth was still bound by layers of thick duct tape, and I could do nothing more than make inaudible noises and screams. The goat man came straight up to me, and started sniffing me like a dog. I almost threw up in my mouth due to the stench that was emanating from this thing. It spoke unnaturally with pauses at odd points and tonal inflections that were wrong on every level with a deep, raspy, thunderous voice. Elena, Agnes, step forward. Mrs. Weatherby and my grandmother both approached the beast. It continued. Silas almost escaped again today. Your insolence behooves me. Munoz was sufficient, but this will not do. This is the last male of my bloodline in existence, besides Silas here. This sacrifice is insufficient. I shall take another blood sacrifice for the night. Please release the male. Mrs. Weatherby and my grandma looked at each other in confusion, but proceeded to do as they were instructed. They approached me took the tape off of my mouth and untied the ropes I was bound by. Immediately, I took off running towards the woods. Before I had even got ten feet, I was being pulled back with a force so strong it almost gave me whiplash. 
It was the tentacle of the beast that wrapped around my waist and pulled me back. Where are you going? It thundered. I was speechless and now paralyzed by fear, laying on the ground helplessly in front of this beast, being held down by its tentacle-like arm. If you run away, I won't be as kind as I was to your little brother here. One male in captivity is enough. If you try to escape, my children will hunt you down and devour you in my name. Brother? He was talking about Silas. How was he my brother? I thought. But that thought quickly escaped my mind as I stared into the face of this monstrosity. He continued to speak. I am a generous god, and I will let you live. However, you can tell no one about what you have witnessed here, and so that you won't, I need you to deliver this year's sacrifice to me. As he said that, he gestured over to Mrs. Weatherby and my grandmother, insinuating that he, it, wanted me to sacrifice them. My stomach dropped, and I was still paralyzed from the sheer terror of this entire situation. I've never killed anyone, nor had I even thought about it. Even if I thought that since these ladies had assaulted me, tied me up, and tried to sacrifice me, that well, they deserved it. The beast creature they referred to as father looked at me straight in the eyes and growled. Choose now. I snapped out of my paralysis because I knew this beast could devour me and grind my bones with its razor-sharp canines extruding from its hideous snout. As I really thought about it, the decision was not that difficult. It came down to kill or be killed, and I decided to kill. I grabbed Mrs. Weatherby and my piece of shit grandmother quite aggressively, took their torches and tied them to the stake. The children began singing loudly again, and Father sniffed the ladies and said, This sacrifice is sufficient. I threw the torch onto the pile of wood, and like a military-grade flamethrower, it burst into flames. Mrs. Weatherby and my grandma were both shrieking in pain as the flames danced around their silhouette and slowly melted the skin off their bones. It was bittersweet. Only a charred shell of what the woman used to be was left as the flames died down. All of a sudden, two little girls that I'd never seen, both wearing porcelain animal masks, quietly walked out of the woods and joined the other kids in the circle. One with a goat mask, and one with a rabbit mask. The smell of burnt flesh filled the air, and I began to gag. The monstrosity called Father walked up to the burnt bodies and started devouring them like a ravenous animal. I watched in horror as the kids joyfully held hands and sang while watching this beast eat. Father stopped eating, looked up at me and said, You have done well, my child. You may leave. I looked at Silas, still in the cage, who had a melancholy look on his face as if he was crying out to me, Take me with you. I couldn't just leave this kid stuck in this madness, especially since he was my brother. The fear and anger boiled up in that instant, making me yell, Father, Silas is my brother. May he come with me too? The beast took a long pause, as his animal hybrid mouth dripped with blood and visceral matter. On one condition, it growled. I now live at my grandmother's house, now my house, with Silas. Oh, and I have a girlfriend I met a year ago, who's pregnant now. She loves me and sees me as an adult. Can't wait for the baby. Everything is good now, but one thing is certain. I will never be a substitute teacher again, because I'm Daniel Jackson, headmaster at Alfred Weatherby Middle School.
Well, look on the bright side. At least he got promoted. <laughs> Even if he had to do some dirty things to get that job. Well, such is the way of the world. Even for us noble teachers, it would seem. Well, another fantastic one from the vault there. If you've got a story that you'd like me to read, send it on over. Can't guarantee I'll read all of them, but I do exclusively now read from my subreddit, not from anywhere else. So if you do, there's a good chance I will at least take a look at it. Can't promise I will, but... I'll do my best. And if you've sent a story and you think I've overlooked it, there's a pretty good chance I have. Um, I do work full-time and this is still just a hobby for me. So if I've missed your story on the subreddit, go ahead and post it again. Chances are I just didn't get around to seeing it. Well, enough for me for one evening. I will of course be back again next week. Until then, wishing you all a fantastic weekend and sweet dreams and bye-bye. Thank you so much for choosing to spend your time listening to me. Now, if you enjoyed the Dr. Creepin experience, then come find me on Facebook. Come chat with me on Twitter. Listen to the background music and download it if you like on SoundCloud. Drop by the store, pick up a t-shirt. And, importantly, if you've got a story you'd like me to read, send it to Dr. Creepin's vault, the subreddit I set up so that I could read your stories. Now, Looking forward to seeing you all again real soon, so come check me out, okay? <laughs>